this has to be one of the most requested topics that I do a video about. And it is all about doing a deep dive into every consideration, both practical and aesthetic, about my artificial turf. So I'm here with my friend David. David, introduce yourself. Yes, my name is David Benditz. And in 2013, I started a company called Next Gen Lawns. And we install artificial grass, artificial turf, and putting greens and focus with dogs. Yes, and we met in 2013, as I recall. So I was working with a client who just had a small area and she needed something that was dog friendly. And I met you then. At that point, I wasn't looking at it really through a gardening lens, just as through a problem solution kind of lens. So in between that time, I was getting so frustrated with my lawn. David, I've shared, I shared this every bit of agony with you about how difficult it was to grow a good looking lawn year round, particularly in the heat of the summer. Um, fungal issues were a problem. Heavy traffic was a problem, lack of rainfall, drought, all of those typical um, kind of enemies we have of any kind of turf and lawn growing in the South. So at that point, uh, after 30 years of trying to grow a good looking lawn, I decided I wanted to look at a better, more permanent and preferably eco-friendly solution. So I started looking into artificial turf, which after looking at you were making fun of me. I maybe, had, I maybe had 50 samples of artificial turf. It brought me back around to you. And what year did you tell me we did my front yard? 2014. 2014. So when I came to you, I said I have two main considera considerations. One, I wanted it to be as realistic as possible, obviously long lasting, but also as eco-friendly as possible. And so we looked at a variety of different samples and which one here do you have that most closely resembles what I have here in the front yard? Um, so the products have changed a little bit since we've done your yard, but this would be the closest product that, to your yard. Okay. Um, your product was one of the first products um, that we kind of came out with to really move the needle um, right. to making things look realistic. And in, in time, you, as you, you know, do more research and, and get your feedback back, you, you learn how to kind of tweak and uh -huh. change things. Uh -huh. um, so we've made a few tweaks to the grass since we've done your yard, but this would be the closest product to that. Okay. A nice, uh, lush lawn um, look for you. And what I like about it, you all, is not only does it look real, it feels real. So I have had as many as 40 people standing, I don't know if I ever told you this story, as many as 40 people standing on my lawn at one time and not one of them knew it wasn't real, including the president of the Oklahoma Horticultural Society who did not know that it wasn't real until I told them. So that is how realistic it looks and it feels and sometimes even feeling it it's kind of difficult to tell, I think, that it's not real. So describe to me some of the characteristics of it that enhance that realistic, beautiful aesthetic of artificial turf. Um, so some of the things that we do with our turf is, one, it's manufactured in the United States. Okay. So you can control the quality of the product of the yarn that's being extruded and made. Um, Second is making sure that you, we call, it's a product called delustering, which gets the shine and the sheen uh -huh. off, yes. of the, off of the turf. Um, so it doesn't look plasticky, uh -huh. it, it makes it look more realistic. Um, and then from there you just, you work on the blades and design the blades to look as close to the type of grass that you're trying to match or right. blend to for the yeah. area of the country that, that you're putting it has, the lawn in. It has and, and this is one of the things that I looked at before we put one square foot down. It has gradations in height. It has subtle gradations in color intensity. So there's variance in the depth of green of each individual blade. It even has thatch. Yes. I mean, it even has thatch. Yeah, so you have um, in the lawn, we always put at least two colors of 
of the, of the stock yarn um, that people see. And then we put two colors of thatching in, um, whether it's green and, and a tan, mm -hmm. or a tan and a chocolate, which will give it a really dark look, which then really gives the turf depth. If you have a shorter turf, it really helps it make it look taller than what it is. Yeah, and I would say, as it compares to a real turf, it looks to me, um, well, what does it look to me? It looks a little bit like a very thick uh, ryegrass overseed of maybe Bermuda or something, which is what I had and which it simulated exactly once we put the turf down. So every year I have really too much shade to be able to grow a really good dense turf in the summertime. Uh, but in the spring and in the fall, it looked just like it looks now. It was great because every year I would have to overseed it with a rye grass and then baby it, um, put fungicides on it, make sure that no squirrels dug divots in it, remove all acorns, any kind of leafy debris on it so that the turf wouldn't suffocate underneath. This has that same look, but without any of those vexing problems. Yes. Um, and one of the things that does help the grass feel realistic under your feet is we do put a infill in the product. Um, so when you put that infill in the product, it gives you that soft ground feel um, that you're walking on. Uh -huh. And so when people are looking at it or they get down on the ground to try to see if it's real or not real, um, they'll run into that infill. Um, and then that kind of also lets them know that it has a natural feel to it. It has a natural give, which is important, I think, if you're a gardener and I'm walking around on it all of the time. And actually, it has more give and more resiliency than my hard pan clay that I had prior to this because of the in-depth uh, preparation that you do beforehand. And we'll talk a little bit about cost down the line, but I think at this point it's important, and tell me if I'm wrong, most of, of the cost is in really the labor of getting it installed and making sure that it has great drainage, that the substrata is just the way you want it, and that you get the look that you want. So most of the expense is probably in the labor by the time you get the turf down. Yes, um, buying the material itself, I mean, it, it is, it's, it's more expensive than sod, obviously, um, for an upfront up, up cost. Um, but the labor dollars to come in, when we come into a yard, we have to dig out the lawn um, that's there and haul it off and dump it. Um, and you do that manually for most yards because you're, you're not able to get big equipment in there and just how take much, the How scoops. much did you excavate off? Maybe so when we, when we do an excavation, it's, it's typically between three to four inches. Okay. Um, and then what that does is after you've dug that out and you put down your geotextile fabric, you come and you put your rock base back in um, and you're building a paver base um, is really what you're building. Um, and what that does is it keeps the ground for the, for the turf stable. Okay. Um, so when it's really, really wet out during a rainy season mm -hmm. or after a big rainstorm in your normal yard, you step on it and you're gonna sink. Uh -huh. your, your foot's gonna get, it's, it's gonna go in. Um, with that thickness of base, that gives somewhere for the water to go and hold while the ground is absorbing it, right. which it keeps everything stable. So you don't get the lumps and bumps in your yard. It doesn't pull your seams mm -hmm. apart or pull it from the sides and gives you excellent drainage mm -hmm. in a nice stable area. And, and to just, do all that you have is to all get manual labor. So you got to take end. out the yeah. grass and then you literally have to fill it all back in with rock and it's got to be compacted and screeded and, and everything to get to the desired. It's, it's, I, I did a long blog post about it when we first introduced the, the turf, and it is a fascinating process. There's a couple of things that, it's the little things sometimes you take pleasure in or that makes it seem more realistic to me, and that's that when you step on it, even though you don't sink, the turf itself, the grass, makes impressions. So you can see just like with a real lawn, you can see those 
footprints when you walk on it, which I just love, anything to enhance the realism. Um, and one more thing, because I know some of you will, will comment on it, when you skim off the dirt, we're not just putting it in a landfill, we're putting it someplace where that topsoil can be reused, recycled, Correct. repurposed. It's not yep. just going into a landfill, we're mindful that this is good, precious topsoil that can be used in, in another way. But let me also, from a gardener's standpoint, let me talk again about a benefit that on the front end, I didn't realize was gonna be so valuable. And that's the quality of good drainage. Because as gardeners, we all know it's all about the drainage, whether it's in your flower beds, whether it's on your lawn, um, it is having good drainage is the key to a plethora of problems. So one thing I discovered was in addition to the obvious that you don't have to water it, um, when it does rain, any of the rainfall that comes down, and in Oklahoma, it all comes down at one time. It doesn't come down over a 24-hour period of time. It all comes down in 30 minutes in a sheet. Um, it's all absorbed by the substrata, the subsurface of the turf itself, which means it doesn't hit that hard pan clay and just run right out into the street and into the sewer. But the residual effect of that is it's absorbed so then it benefits my flower beds. So not only am I not having to water the mosquitoes or, <laughs> or my grass, but I don't have to water my flower beds as much. Now that was an added benefit I, I didn't think through. It seems obvious now, but it's really a wonderful benefit. Yeah, by allowing that water to sit in that aggregate base, uh -huh. it gives it time for the ground to physically absorb it versus right. shedding it off into the sewer system. Yeah, or, um, or just pooling in your backyard or, and attracting mosquitoes. Correct. Um, and so when it's going into the soil, then the root systems of your plants have, have that water that they can get to. Um, so it's getting more water from a natural rainfall than it would typically. Okay, so there are, and we won't go into all of the different varieties, price points, uh, different kinds of looks you can get with this turf. But let me just say, all artificial turf is not equal. That is an understatement. Um, you, most of you have undoubtedly walked on some really bad artificial turf or synthetic turf that literally crunched when you walk on it walked on it. You can't walk on it barefooted because it's so prickly right. um, and so stiff it feels like walking on bristle brushes. So all artificial turf is not the same and even within next gen lawns there are so many different varieties from, okay you said you use it for playgrounds, you use it putting greens, pets. Yes, so um, we do lawns, we do playgrounds, we do it our biggest segment is for dogs, for the pet application, okay. um, because it keeps the area clean and it's easy to clean up because the waste is, is sitting on the top of the turf. It right. dries very quickly and can be cleaned really easily. And then the pets aren't bringing the mud in the house or the dirt in the house mm -hmm. and they can't dig through it. So the digging is eliminated. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I do... have to say, I have gotten so much pleasure out of looking at my kitchen window and, and looking at squirrels trying to dig divots <laughs> into my yard and they can't do it. And that gives me so much pleasure. I right. Have tell, I have to tell you. But so dog runs. Yes. Yeah, so dog runs are, are areas of uh, yards for dogs. Okay. Um, if you have a dog and you have a shade umbrella on your yard, you're going to have to be reseeding all the, all time, the time because uh, grasses like fescue don't replenish themselves. They mm -hmm. have to be reseeded. Right. Um, and dogs are just very, very hard on the lawn itself. And you told me, and we won't go really into all of the science of it, because there is science involved about the different kinds of backings for the various turf quad, uh, qualities that you can get. But I encourage you to go to David's website, Next Gen's website, we'll put the link up, where you can really do a deep dive into what makes it, um, what, Micro microbial, did you say? So, yes, so it, we have now added an antimicrobial additive okay. to the backing to help prevent against smells, um, mold, funguses, stuff like that. 
it helps to shed the water and the urine and everything. So it doesn't just fester so and smell. That's correct. Yes, it just leaches back back through. So it is perfect if you have pets. And I just opened this brochure and there's my house, David. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Did I sign off on that? I can't remember. <laughs> um, but I, we did the, my front yard in 2014. Uh -huh. And then as soon as I saved up my pennies, we did the backyard in 2016. A couple more considerations, um, mostly practical. And then let's move to the backyard to talk about just a couple more aesthetic considerations if we, if we can. Number one, from a personal standpoint, before I did this, I did do my due diligence. I looked at things that were important to me, obviously authenticity, how realistic it looked, but also the ecological considerations. This is made in America, that it is recyclable. No, it doesn't attract pollinators, but neither does my driveway or gravel or a pool or Correct. Re really anything doesn't attract pollinators. The other thing I took into account was that I minimized to the greatest extent possible the surface area of turf that I had before I went to an artificial turf. Um, and so most of what you see in my front yard is actually beds rather than turf, with, which I think enhances the realistic quality and the realistic nature of what it looks like. So to me, and this is where David and I, I don't necessarily, we know have a, have a difference of opinion, but just a difference of application. To me, where I think it looks best is in instances where you have what I call a throw rug of a lawn. So I have a throw rug of a lawn in front and I have a throw rug of a lawn in the back. And to me, that makes it seem so much more realistic because it is juxtaposed against all of this natural greenery. I even let uh, just what few weeds will come up through it. I even kind of allow them to come up through it to make it look natural. But you say uh, if you have a large lawn or an expansive lawn, don't let that deter you. So talk a little bit about that. Um, and, and probably, I'm just going to spill the beans, that probably the biggest celebrity client you have is Bob Stoops, the, or who was the, the former head coach of the OU Sooners. But talk a little bit about really expansive lawns and how frequently you do those. Um, yeah, so the, the typical lawn that we do, and we do all sizes, so we've done 100 square foot to half an acre. Um, so we do all in between, and, and the bigger lawns do cost money. They are an investment. They are mm -hmm. tens of thousands of dollars. Um, but I would say on average, and I would have to go back and look, every year it continues to grow um, in the sizes that we do really? as it becomes more and more popular and people mm -hmm. realize the benefits. And a lot of it is coming in new construction. So they're, so they're doing the home and then they're not paying to have the sod put in. They're not paying mm -hmm. to have the sprinkler put, system put mm -hmm. in in the whole yard. And so they're able to save some money and put it towards the turf. And then they know that once that's in there, the maintenance is very minimal. Yeah. Um, so now they don't have all the mowing and, and the watering and, and just everything, just weed eating and just all the everyday stuff that you have to do every week, whether you do it or you pay somebody right. to do it. But I would, on average now, our, our typical size lawn is, is around a thousand square feet, okay. um, which depends on the market that you're in as far as cost. But to try to kind of give people some cost ideas, um, there's some markets where you can be on a, on a yard that size around seven to seven dollars and fifty cents a square foot. Okay. In other markets, um, it could be as much as. 16 to 17 dollars a square depending foot. Depending on where you are. Depends on where you live, depends on the accessibility of the supplies um, right. and then what it takes to get to the property and then what the labor force costs are, are for that your, market. In your area. So all those things contribute. So um, in, in, in terms of cost and, and I will put, we'll put a graphic up with all of this information on it so you don't have to go through this whole video and watch it, <clears throat> watch it again to get the metrics of making an investment like this. But if, so in the Oklahoma City area, 
what would you say, Oklahoma City, Tulsa area, to give a guideline for people, approximately what is it a square foot where we live? So in Oklahoma, it's approximately on the low end, eight dollars and fifty cents i mean if we okay. go into you know a three to five thousand square foot yard right. it'll go a little lower than that yeah. uh, but most properties that we do in oklahoma are around nine to ten dollars a square okay. foot okay so let me speak a little bit to a return on your investment so i would say i have already paid for this grass it was an initial upfront cost but i've already paid for this grass i know ten times over and it's not just the obvious things that you think about. It's not just the fact that I don't have to water it, that I don't have to oversee it, seed it, that I don't have to pay for the labor of both of those or expend my own labor. I don't have to, at the time I put this in, I needed to buy a new lawnmower. I didn't have to buy a new lawnmower. I didn't have to buy any of not only the, the equipment for the upkeep of the lawn itself, but I didn't have to buy or, or have any of the upkeep for the lawn equipment. Correct. Um, I've been able to have functions and garden tours and things like that year round, which I could not have had in the past. Um, I think, and tell me if this is still true because I'm asked all the time, I can't tell any difference from when it was first laid down, but I think at one time you told me it had maybe a 2% fade rate every yeah, so the, 10 years Yeah, so it has a UV, so anything in the sun fades. Right. Um, and so as we tell people, so if you ever have a sales rep selling you something and they say it doesn't fade, they're not being honest. But okay. what you, what the ultimate goal is to slow the fade rate. So we have UV inhibitors that are in the yarn um, to protect it from fading as best as we can, but it fades about one to two percent okay. every ten years. So over the lifespan of the turf, you're going to get a, a four to six percent fade. I can remember asking you <laughs> if you'd ever had to replace any, because in Oklahoma we're notorious for our eye storms. You know, has there been heavy limb damage? Has there been damage of any kind? And at that time, you may not remember it, but you told me the only time that you'd ever had to replace any of it because of damage was because somebody tried to mow it. <laughs> so that is a testament to the realism of this turf. So let's go to the backyard. I wanna talk nothing but design and aesthetics back there if we can. And some of the other things that put NextGen for me over the top in comparison to some other synthetic turf companies.